Hello, everyone. Bonjour à tout le monde. Welcome, bienvenue. Uh, my name is Wesley Critchlow. Je m'appelle Wesley Critchlow. I'm a professor of criminology at Ontario Tech, and I teach within the critical race theory framework, intersectionality, decolonization frameworks. Um, welcome to this session on the, on the HSJC Anti-Racism Framework Project. We have an, a stellar group of presenters today with us. I'm joined by my colleague, Anna Pishanasquik, who will be my co-moderator and will assist me in um, facilitating questions. Brief housekeeping notes before we get started. Please, uh, I draw your attention to the buttons on your screen in which you'll introduce uh, your questions and I will then take them to the speakers. We will do our best as much as we can to facilitate as many questions given the, in the interest of time. Please ensure all microphones are muted and uh, mute until the QA, and the QA question portion is open. We are recording the session and the session will be uploaded to the website for future viewing. I think it will be up for 90 days after which I think it will be taken down. So you have a 90 day access. If the presenter has documents and participants, direct them to the session page and links and you will find them there. At the end of the session, we ask that you complete a brief survey of the session for your feedback. Your feedback is helpful in ensuring moving forward, we rectify any ditches, any glitches we had in terms of um, addressing this work. Lastly, and most importantly, uh, as we gather here today to do this work, uh, we gather in the name of collective will, goodwill, peace, and respect, and that we engage in a collegial process and conversation with everyone, and that we thoughtfully consider the words we use in ways that as not to cause harm and violence and not to engage us in, in any form of disruptive behavior we are living in, in as we live through the session. Um, before I get introduced to the speakers, are there any any questions anyone have before uh, of the attendees have that it was not clear? I don't know if there is a translation English French button. I don't think that it, that feature exists, um, but um, I don't know if anybody can answer that. In, if there's a French English translation button, that was the only thing I think was missing from the. No, okay, okay. Thank you so much. So welcome to the HSJC Anti Racism Framework Project. Uh, in response to the government's uh, commitment to anti-racism framework within criminal justice, in particular as how it impacts uh, indigenous, black and racialized communities. We are here today to discuss um, members met from, met with members from the advisory committee. They have conducted research across the province and the network, and they would be sharing that work with you. Uh, the first speaker would be Andrew Fairburn, and after that, Andrew will introduce, call the next speaker's name. The speakers have already agreed on the list. When Andrew is finished, Andrew will call the next speaker's name and vice versa. And then when, when, when we are finished, I will facilitate the questions. Thank you so much and welcome once again. Andrew, I pass it over to you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Wesley, for the kind introductions. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the land I'm standing on from is the traditional territory of the Wendat, the Ananishabak Nation, the Haudenosaunee, the Métis, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The treaty was signed for this land is collectively referred to as the Toronto Purchase Treaty 13. To make this presentation uh, more interactive, I'd like uh, to ask the audience the question, whose land are you currently standing on? If you know, please put it in the chat. And if you're not sure which land you're standing on, please do the work and find out during the presentation. I left a link to help you find out. And before um, we start, I'd like to say thank you to all the members of the Provincial Anti-Racism Advisory Committee and the Anti-Racism Working Group, Framework Working Group, and the Community Connectors for their support on their work on this project over the last few years. So I want to go over um, today's agenda. Here's a quick overview of what we'll be presenting today. First, we'll have um, discuss, have a chat about the HSJCC network 
and the provincial HSJCC. Um, we'll do a little project overview, um, the methodology, some of the findings and the data of the community connector experience, um, implementations and recommendations and next steps. So the provincial HSJCC, some folks attending today may not be familiar with the provincial HSJCC. So I wanted to provide a short overview of the network and the provincial table. The HSJCC network was established in 1997 in response to a recognized need in Ontario to coordinate resources and services and plan more effectively for people with clinical needs who come in contact with the law. The provincial HSJCC acts as a planning body and leadership mechanism for the HSJCC network. The provincial HSJCC is com comprised of various advisory committees, including the provincial HSJCC um, committee addressing anti-racism and the anti-racism framework working group subcommittee. Some of those um, objectives of the provincial HSJCCs to support the individual and collective efforts of regional and local committees to identify provincial service and policy issues and make recommendations to address issues um, appropriate ministries or stakeholders. Also to identify solutions and systemic um, problems and also to promote consistency of approach across Ontario while recognizing regional diversity. The HSJCC Secretariat um, was established in 2015 and are responsible for implementing the objectives and work plan of the provincial HSJCC and supporting the HSJCC network infrastructure. So now I'm gonna discuss um, some of the priorities of the HSJCC. The provincial HSJCC, um, through a survey of its member, identified issues for specialized populations within Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations, along with youth, as one of its top priorities. And I'll provide a little background of the actual committees themselves, um, the anti-racism committees. The HSJCC network has long acknowledged that one of the negative impacts of slavery, colonization, oppression is the overrepresentation of Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations within the mental health and criminal justice system. Following high profile incidents of anti racism, both provincially and internationally, as well as feedback received from our regional HSJCCs, the provincial HSJCC committed to identifying ways the HSJCC network can be a leader in addressing anti-racism. So in response to requests from HSJCC members across the network looking for additional guidance and support in improving anti-racism policies and strategies, the provincial HSJCC approved the establishment of a standing advisory committee to oversee and guide the development of this work in November of 2020. A working group was established out of that committee in January of 2023 um, to support scoping, evaluation, knowledge exchange, and other work plan activities as part of the development of an anti-racism framework for the provincial HSJCC network. So as part of the first steps in developing an anti-racism framework, the working group developed a project charter including um, priorities that include um, ensuring anti-racism is a priority item for local, regional, and provincial HSJCCs, provide provincial guidance and consistent approach to addressing anti-racism across the human services and justice systems, and provide concrete ways the HSJCC network can participate in dismantling a structural and systemic racism. Some of those outputs uh, included um, an environmental scan of existing anti-racism frameworks relevant to the work 
of the HSJCC network, which has been completed, conducted two sets of focus groups, one with HSJCC members and the other with Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations, service users, and providers, which was completed in June of 2023. An evaluation uh, report that was uh, recently uh, completed in October and what we'll be discussing today. And then future work implementation of a provincial framework strategy for the HSJCC network in addressing anti-racism, which also will include items, um, knowledge exchange activities and webinars. Some of the outcomes were local, regional, and provincial HSJCCs would embed anti-racism lens as part of their ongoing work. Professionals working in human services and justice sectors um, to have an increased awareness and understanding of how to address anti-racism. The HSJCC network actively um, participates in concrete ways of dismantling structural and systemic racism across sectors and local and regional um, the provincial HSJCCs to, prove, to improve the representation and meaningful engagement of Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations as part of their work. But, and here's a timeline of the work um, to date that was um, discussed earlier. And as part of that um, work up to October, I'm going to um, let Shireen do, um, do the methodology of this um, work. Shireen Rampersad, who Thank you is much. also the lead of the um, anti-racism um, framework working group. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Good Afternoon, everyone. My name is Shereen Rampersad, and like Andrew has mentioned, I am uh, the working group lead for the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. So I'm going to take us through a little bit of our methodology when we were conducting um, this project. One of our first priorities was to conduct a preliminary scan of any existing anti-racism initiatives that were um, already happening within the justice and social service sectors in Ontario. We wanted to do this to inform the work that we were embarking on. And following the scan in the summer of 2021, the committee created and distributed a survey to regional and local HSJCC chairs. The purpose for the survey was to identify what strategies and initiatives the HSJCC network had already developed to address racism and discrimination, and also what barriers were preventing the network from prioritizing anti-racism initiatives. And that would lead us to see how the provincial HSJCC could offer leadership to develop creative ways and concrete ways to dismantle structural and systemic racism across the human services and justice sectors. So based on the results of the survey that I just mentioned, um, our ARAC committee identified the following priority areas. There's overrepresentation of Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations within just the sector. However, lack of anti-racism lens is applied to the work. We also found that there was a lack of provincial direction on how to address anti-racism within the HSJCC network. A lack of awareness and training addressing anti-racism in the human service and justice sectors. A lack of culturally appropriate resources and services within organizations. And a lack of Black, Indigenous, and racialized individuals in positions of power at the decision-making level. We also found that there was discriminatory hiring practices within local agencies, decreasing the capacity of services to meet the needs of certain populations. The survey itself was completed anonymously and included 14 questions, which were multiple choice, but respondents also had the opportunity to include comments and give context to their answers. We received 24 responses from 24 we received responses from 24 HSJCC regional and local chairs. Um, and the survey questions were designed to identi identify what anti-racism initiatives HSJCCs were already supporting, what supports they felt they needed to improve their anti-racism work at the HSJCC level, and how 
HSGCCs felt they could recruit and support Black, Indigenous, and racialized members, and how the province or how the provincial HSJCC could prioritize anti-racism training and guidelines across the problem, province. To address some of these priorities, the ARAC formed a framework working group to support the development of a provincial framework that aims to ensure anti-racism is a priority for local, regional, and provincial HSJCCs to provide some provincial guidance and a consistent approach to addressing anti-racism across the human services and justice systems, and to establish concrete ways that the network can participate in dismantling structural and systemic racism. The working group created the framework outline based on each of the priority areas identified in the survey, surveys, and as Andrew had mentioned as well, created the project charter. So the questions the working group designed um, were based on each of the areas of the framework. The focus were guided by prompts. And I wanna give you a few excerpts from the survey questions. Um, so 88.5% of respondents <clears throat> answered that their HSJCC does not have a strategy and or work plan to address anti-racism. 95.65% of respondents answered no to the question, does your HSJCC have representation from Black, Indigenous, and or racialized individuals who identify as persons of lived experience of both the human services and justice sectors? So I say again, 95.65% of respondents do not have, feel that they have representation within their HSJCC. 70% of respondents answered no to has your HSJCC received any training or is working to develop training related to addressing anti-racism within the human services and justice sectors. So again, 70%, so over half of the HSJCCs that responded do not have any training or haven't developed any training around anti-racism and addressing such. So the, uh, the next step for us was to create um, an outreach strategy. So in the spring of 2023, a call went out to have community connectors um, to help us to run the focus groups that we, we had planned to run. So the provincial HSJCC secretariat created flyers that were sent out to various internal um, HSJCC committee uh, email distribution lists and community connectors, which you'll hear about in the next few slides, were provided an audience map of potential participants that they could send the sec to the secretariat to register for the focus groups. The participants were registered on a first come first serve basis with the goal of registering between eight and 10 participants per group. The focus group sessions were recorded for analysis purposes, but confident confidentiality was upheld and there was no camera facing requirement or need to self identify during the focus groups. Furthermore, no identifying information of participants was disclosed. All the participant names were removed and coded during the analysis. So the secretariat was at the focus groups in order to note take and keep a record of um, the conversations at the focus groups, but only the relevant data to the project and the report was shared in terms of broad themes to enhance making meaning of the data. And participants were provided an honorarium in the form of a monetary gift card for their time and lending their expertise to the project. At any time, participants were able to withdraw from the focus groups and ask for their shared content to not be included in this project. So to give us a little bit more information about the focus groups themselves, I'm going to turn it over to Valeria. Thank you, Shireen. So the criteria set out for the community connectors was that they identified as either black, indigenous or racialized and had experience working in the community with those populations. It was important that they had strong facilitation skills and a firm understanding of the objectives of the HSJCC network. The role of the community connectors was to work in collaboration with the focus group participants. And it was in this spirit of collaboration that we chose the title community connector as opposed to facilitator or focus group leader. 
These were intentional decisions made to set the tone for a synergistic discussion where all voices were equally valued. The feedback garnered from this discussion would inform the development of the provincial framework, and we wanted to create a space where all and any contributions were encouraged. Um, as was already, I think, touched on, the task of recruiting community connectors was mainly accomplished through email, emailing the HSJCC network, uh, word of mouth, and reaching out to peers. Next slide, please. So here you have a graphic of our participant profile. Um, participants self-identified by the group they signed up for. Um, participants from each of the identified groups met virtually with the community connectors for their scheduled focus groups. The sessions were scheduled for two hours and participants were encouraged to email the group if they had any additional feedback after the session ended. We were cognizant of the fact that participants for a variety of reasons may not have fully expressed their thoughts and ideas during the session. So we wanted to offer an option um, to continue giving that feedback once the focus group was, had ended. Um, some of the groups had more participants than others, um, but across all groups, there was a diversity of experiences thoughts and opinions, which did allow for rich discussion. Next slide, please. In designing the focus groups, uh, the team identified the underrepresented groups whose, whose voices would be valuable in building this anti-racism framework. Subsequently, the groups created were for people who identified as black, indigenous or racialized respectively these three groups were further separated into two groups, one for service providers and the other for service users. The participants that identified as service users were defined as a member of a local, regional, or provincial HSJCC who identified as either Black, racialized, or Indigenous and accessed or received support from human services or justice organizations. The participants that identified as service providers were defined as a member of a local, regional, or provincial HSJCC who were part of a service provider organization that supported Black, Indigenous, or racialized clients who access human services and justice systems. This resulted in six focus groups. During our discussions as a working group, we realized that we could not have a balanced dialogue about anti-racism without creating a space to ask pointed questions about white privilege and systemic racism. This session would provide a deep dive into current perspectives on white privilege and systemic racism that would not necessarily arise out of the other six focus groups. This focus group was open to non-racialized and racialized individuals, as well as service users and service providers who wanted to share their insights. As a result, we hosted seven focus groups. I will pass it on uh, to Ashley Addison, uh, project manager for the HSJCC to discuss some of the data and our findings. Much, Valerie. Um, I would like to welcome you all to our session. My name is Ashley Addison. As Valerie mentioned, I'm the project manager for the uh, PHSJCC Secretariat. Um, I'm going to walk us through some of the findings from the focus groups. Um, there's about seven in total, so it's um, consolidated um, data from seven different transcripts. So this is just a general overview of the findings. Just wanted to let you all know that um, they were successful in informing, you know, how we build out that anti-racism framework um, across the HSJCCs. So some things to note here um, were throughout the presentation, you'll notice um, a lot of uh, percentages. Um, so the percentages are based on either the entire sample of 26 participants or um, percentages are by service user or service provider, which you'll note in the charts. 
um, skipped. So there's a column for skipped responses. Um, that does not mean that those participants were skipped. Um, those They were just unresponsive. So we didn't capture um, a response from them. Um, some groups did not actually ask the questions directly due to time. So um, throughout the discussions, as mentioned before, um, if, the, if a discussion was spirited and people were really getting into it, um, there wasn't a lot of time to ask the follow-up questions or the prompts. So that's another reason why you probably would see skipped. Um, in that in that particular focus group, the question wasn't asked directly. Um, charts represent responsiveness and not necessarily responded yes. Um, for the questions that are more um, close, like do do you or does this, um, it could mean yes, the charts, but overall the charts that I share represent the data sample. So um, by having the data sample there, you could see if the data is more indigenous focused or black focused, you can see through the charts why that is. It's based on who responded. Um, and finally, um, throughout the sections of my um, presentation, you'll notice some headers. So those headers actually uh, directly relate to the prompt headers. Um, and we hope to use those same headers when we are building out our framework. So to kick things off, um, we the focus groups, all seven of them um, were given some prompts. Um, and it was to get them get everyone thinking about their racial identity, um, the impacts and their views on anti-black indigenous racism in Canada, and how it affected their service use or delivery. So you can see a chart here where it says, does talking about racism, um, or your racial identity make you uncomfortable? So this chart represents those who answered yes. Um, one participant mentioned that despite having an ind Indigenous background, um, they did feel uncomfortable due to their white passing appearance, which made them frequently question about their heritage. So throughout my um, portion of the presentation, I will share some quotes. So this particular person shared an experience where they tried to get a new bank card and they asked um, her for ID. And she mentioned that she only had her Métis citizenship card and they were, you know, not familiar with this type of ID. And, you know, this person tried to explain that it was their Métis citizenship. You know, it's as valid as a passport, a driver's license. Um, but at, during that, uh, that um, encounter, they actually flagged their Métis ID as a refugee status or um, immigrant status, which, you know, obviously this person disagreed with. So when they tried to use their new card later, um, it didn't quite work out for them. And they ended up having to wait three months before going back because they just didn't feel comfortable um, going back to that particular um, bank. And, you know, um, uh, they ended up having, when they did go back to get the card, they ended up just pick, uh, using their passport. So they didn't want to go through that experience again, um, you know, using their Métis citizenship card. So that kind of uh, gives you an insight into, you know, the discomfort that some of the respondents felt, you know, when talking about their racial identity. Um, on the other side of that, some other service providers um, did not feel uncomfortable because they worked in a predominantly Indigenous place, which goes to show that, like, a lot of comfort comes from your surroundings as well um, on whether you want to, you know, discuss your racial identity or not. So uh, the next section is uh, just a background section. And, you know, in this section, they were sent the anti-racism acknowledgement, which um, Andrew uh, briefly went over in the beginning. So they had a chance to review it. And, you know, they were asked, you know, does this, you know, accurately and meaningfully address historic forms of racism? And, you know, 25% 25, 25 of service users did feel that it was, you know, it did address historical forms of racism. However, um, one participant did indicate like, you know, this has been a long time coming, like we're just getting into it now. There's a quote here that says, you know, when COVID-19 came around, it was new. Nobody had any idea about it. And within a span of 12 months, the entire world changed its behavior to handle COVID. You know, anti-Black racism is something we've struggled with for many years. And the amount of money and the amount of effort that's been pumped into it, but we've yet to see any change. And, you know, as quickly as we figured out COVID, we're still trying to figure out anti-racism. So although we were getting started, it's been a long time coming and 
and um, you know participants express their frustration and how long it's been taking to address this form of racism. Um, I have a slide here with just you know a bit of background. Participants were asked, you know, what we what is missing from that acknowledgement um, as it relates to overrepresentation of Indigenous, Black, and racialized uh, populations in the health, human services, and justice systems. So they did share that, um, you know, uh, there's a overrepresentation of marginalized, racialized populations in mental health and justice systems. Um, they emphasized um, that what may be missing is, you know, reconnecting Indigenous people to their communities. So when they are seeking services, trying to connect them with, you know, their cultural uh, services. Um, you know, they mentioned that we should de be developing policies and frameworks to address the lack of representation in certain roles, more specifically psychotherapy. Um, we also discussed the need for, you know, workers who are culturally sensitive. Um, partic particularly Indigenous court workers. Um, they highlighted the, you know, the competition around resourcing. And, you know, if we are going to have an acknowledgement, we need to acknowledge that there is a lack of funding and there's lots of Indigenous uh, populations um, in support of housing and, in, in, uh, and who are homeless. Um, they also uh, emphasize the importance of recognizing that we do need open, safe spaces to have these discussions um, you know, similar to these focus groups, they're divided by, you know, racial group. Um, they were hoping to have a similar space to discuss concerns. Um, and, you know, just uh, regarding, you know, some of this acknowledgement, there's lim limited access to culturally relevant products and services um, in prison systems and courts, making sure that, you know, Black and Indigenous folks and, you know, other people of color do have access to those tools and those products. And just the overall focusing on racialized individuals with disabilities, um, access to language interpreters, increased representation in the healthcare sector, as we mentioned before, makes a huge difference. And just establishing platforms for, for reporting um, incidents of racism. So uh, this next section um, talks about guiding principles. So these guidelines were shared in advance and they're on your screen. Um, and participants were asked, you know, whether they felt it, it, it held um, HSJCCs accountable. So you can see that there's some bullet points here and that's what we're speaking to in terms of accountability. Um, the majority of the respondents did feel the principles outlined did, you know, hold HSJCCs accountable. However, um, one user felt that these these principles were quite broad and we would need to see them properly executed um, long term in order to properly assess whether, you know, this did hold them accountable. Um, participants were asked, you know, what are missing from these guiding principles? And they highlighted the significance of starting anti-racism education from an early age um, and developing comprehensive educational programs targeting the roots of systemic racism within the communities. So really just driving it on home that, you know, anti-racism, you know, should start as soon as possible because, it, you know, society is a model of uh, white supremacy. And the sooner that everyone gets started with early education, the better. Um, other users stress the importance of recognizing diversity among Indigenous cultures and languages, advocating for tailored services in cultural education. One service provider from the Indigenous group um, emphasized the misconceptions often associated with pan-Indigenous approach. You know, they're not all the same, so they should be treated differently. And they stress the importance of educating external services about the unique cultural aspects of each Indigenous community and advocating for a new, more nuanced understanding of that. So just how, how we, we have different land acknowledgements per region, we do need to, we can't treat all Indigenous people the same and just use a blanketed approach. So now moving on to guidelines on messaging. So, um, you know, this section of the focus group was around, you know, developing um, guidelines for messaging within the framework. How are we going to speak about um, anti-racism? What are the key messages that, you know, we should include in this framework? So um, participants were asked, you know, if the key messages should include, like what should they include and what are some unique considerations 
for Black, Indigenous, and racialized populations um, within the those guidelines. So the topic of motherhood came up in response, you know, in that should be a key, unique consideration when we talk about messaging. So uh, this one mother, I have a quote here on the slide mentioned, I remember having access to healthcare, having access to meals that were healthy enough for myself and my baby. So starting all the way back here, you know, the mindset the mother is in to raise a child and, you know, to give that child, you know, a fresh start starting all the way at the beginning. Um, just basically mess, just basically highlighting that, you know, anti um, systemic racism happens in the womb because the condition that the mother is in um, affects the baby, right? Um, this person's mentioning, you know, I need to have healthy access. I need to have access to healthy food. I need to have access to healthcare. I need to not be stressed. So you can imagine from birth, the amount of impact that makes on the individual being born into that. And we know of social determinants of health, it kind of starts from the day you're born. So that's one thing that they want to make clear, you know, to talk about pregnancy and, you know, new mother programs that address that, you know, that disparity in healthcare. Some other unique considerations were, um, you know, obviously mentioned tailored healthcare, tailored healthcare for Black and Indigenous communities, um, you know, dedicating resources to anti-racism efforts. Um, recognizing diversity of Indigenous experiences and, um, you know, compassionate approach, approaches to addressing racism. Um, we'll move on to the next slide where it talks about education. So this part of the focus groups um, included discussions around education supports, as well as um, accessibility and whether it should be mandatory or not. Um, they also talked about whether geographical location and the comp com composition of HSJCCs should influence the educational framework, you know, aiming for an inclusive and context-specific approach. So what that means is, you know, all the HS HSJCCs are spread throughout Ontario, and they all have different demographics. So within this framework, should we address that, saying, you know, in this particular region like Kenora, maybe we put more efforts into Indigenous educational efforts. If it's downtown, maybe it's more focused on homelessness or something like that. Um, you know, 12%, we, they asked, you know, what, what types of education should be included? You know, what are some considerations? 12% of the entire group, you know, thought that a comprehensive um, history of black, of black history, you know, beyond what we hear about in terms of slavery. Um, they talked about, you know, education, for 8% wanted uh, more education around colonization and the impacts of residential school systems. Um, you know, the need to um, transcribe guidelines into indigenous languages. So in terms of education, making sure that we are sharing the indigenous language and we are taking into account maybe even the languages of the region of the HSJCCs HSGCC, HS, and whether we need to translate it into that specific language. We also, uh, participants uh, noted the significance and uh, recognizing and challenging unconscious biases within the healthcare system. So a part of education is maybe de-education and you know, unlearning some things that are ingrained in you. And, you've, and that's um, you know, here in this quote where it says, education like a process through which people become aware of their biases. I think many people see themselves as not racist and not aggressively racist or overtly racist. So they never really take the time to explore how they might have biases and stereotypes that affect how they approach you. I would say in my lifetime, one of the things that stands out is not being believed or someone assuming you're exaggerating or trying to scam a system. And I just think we would impact a lot of people if people took the time to really become aware of their biases, then have more of a reflex when they're interacting with people to catch that and say, I'm making an assumption right now, let me move away from that. So as I mentioned, a lot of education is really de-education, deep programming. Um, one of my slides I think got mixed up. If you go to the next slide. Oh, perfect, okay. So here's just a summary of some of the, the ideas that came out of those focus groups. So, you know, equity training, face-to-face -face training, um, training specific to your role as a service provider, um, you know, training in modules, uncovering biases that we mentioned above, 
um, equity and child welfare, you know, training based on addressing equity issues within the child welfare system, um, and just overall incorporating anti-racism into trainings that we offer already, making sure that we are using the right terms, that we're being mindful, um, that we're being intentional. So maybe it's not a specific anti-racism training, but as we're doing other trainings, just having more of that foresight. Um, there's some other stats here um, in terms of accessibility. So participants were asked, what are some ways we can ensure education is accessible across the HSJCCs? So 8%, you know, said um, maybe using digital formats and maybe mobile apps. Another 8% highlighted um, the need for cont continuity and accountability to ensure that it's effective and being implemented. 4% um, su suggested centralizing education and um, you know making sure they're accessible online. And overall, um, you know, making education, uh, education materials available in paper, paper format, um, particularly for communities without reliable internet access, including elders. So oftentimes in our deprogramming in our anti-racism education efforts, we do need to recognize accessibility. Um, you know, anti-racism is intersectional. So uh, making sure that, you know, not everyone has access to reliable internet. So, you know, still using paper formats for some of the resources we come out with. Um, the question of whether it should be mandatory or voluntary drew mixed responses from the respondents. One person advocated for a voluntary approach while others wanted, um, you know, more of a hybrid approach. Some expressed concerns about mandatory education, suggesting that education should be more encouraged as people may not embrace it if it's like forced on them. So it's up to the HSJCCs whether they wanna make it mandatory or not, but that was just a suggestion um, from one of the participants. So uh, when it comes down to meaningful engagement, um, this section challenged, um, you know, uh, address challenges faced by HSJCCs um, when they are engaging Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities. And it was, you know, this section wanted to identify barriers and, you know, have some suggestions on how we could have more meaningful engagement as part of the framework. Um, participants were asked, what uh, has your experience been engaging with a regional or local HSJCC. So only 33% of service users have experience engaging with their local and regional HSJCC. We asked, do you have any thoughts on the ways that the HSJCC network could improve engagement with um, other you know, populations, Black, Indigenous, racialized? Um, they recommended um, increasing funding. Um, they recommended a proactive approach to outreach to Indigenous organizations rather than just waiting for them to show up. So, you know, actually, if you're going to be meaningful, actually make the take the time, effort, and budget to actually go out there. 8% um, emphasize the need to follow through on their commitments. And, you know, making sure that, um, you know, that you're not just collecting data for the sake of collecting data, that it's actually, like, leading to some meaningful change. Um, participants were asked, you know, what um, barriers to accessing services um, and, you know, uh, what prevented them, you know, from, you know, working with the HSGCC or feeling comfortable working with a, a service provider. One participant said, you know, past experiences will tell, tell my husband, you know, not to go back to that particular place again because of the experience that he had. So the challenges or a barrier is, you know, past experience that we've had, it will hinder us from, you know, seeking out services. If you had a bad experience at a restaurant, you probably won't go back to eat there. You have to, you might miss out. So just basically saying that if they've had a bad experience, you know, they're not going to come back to that service, you know, and then you lose people. So that's sort of one of the barriers to meaningful engagement is how do we build trust and making services accessible and welcoming to those who do have um, uh, mistrust and have, have faced prior challenges. Um, 
Next, we're going to, this section talks about race-based data collection. So this was a, a section of the, another section for the focus groups. Participants were asked whether their organization or service provider collected data, and they all responded yes, which you saw in this chart. Um, uh, regarding recommendations and how data should be used, participants suggested that collected data could help identify gaps in collection and be compared to anti-racism frameworks, offering insights into the severity of issues within specific communities. And this could actually help create more tailored interventions. Um, another recommendation included, you know, be specific, um, you know, when you're using data, um, use the data to allocate, you know, better funding and foster relationships um, with Black and Indigenous people. Um, data should be leveraged to inform policy decisions in healthcare and identify areas of support for further development. Um, there were concerns, and in terms of data collection, you know, not putting the burden of of proof on the individuals. So that means if you are collecting race-based data, you know, not having them have to prove who they are, um, third-party certification, um, you know, having to prove their status, um, as mentioned earlier, with their IDs. Um, there was apprehension around data collection. You know, some people just weren't comfortable with law enforcement collecting their information. A lot of the times they're getting information collected and they're like, why do you need this? Um, you know, ethical data collection, you know, making sure that data is used for, you know, good intentions and, you know, making sure that it is a catalyst for change. So one of the recommendations in terms of data collection is to promote transparency. What are you using this data for? Um, you know, what is the intent behind it? And also getting a follow up on, OK, we collected this data. What does it inform and why did we why did uh, why was it collected and, and what are the next steps? That's kind of what we're doing right now accountability around data collection with this presentation. Um, so uh, we talked about best practices as well. So you could see here just some of the best practices that came out. Um, I'm not going to go through them because I'm short on time, but you could see that they asked what resources could be helpful in terms of best practices. So there's lots of suggestions here, just making sure it's transparent, inclusive, um, that we integrate resources that already exist like the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Calls to Action, um, the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Report. Um, and, you know, there's some takeaways there for sure. We also did a focus group on systemic racism and, you know, um, participants were asked about systemic racism and, you know, what, what needs to change or, or how can, uh, services improve. So they asked for the need to, for a comprehensive and um, uh, making sure that um, it's tangible and meaningful rather than performative. So that was a big one across the data for, for all of these focus groups was accountable, meaningful, intentional, um, how to implement anti-racism work. 36% um, emphasize community involvement, uh, reporting issues, support and awareness programs called for mandatory anti-racism training within organizations. So this is a bit different because it's a completely different group. They were, they were asked completely different questions. So you noticed in the other group, they weren't into mandatory training. In this group, they were. Um, I'm just gonna just quickly go through the last bit of data. Um, you know, you can take some time to read what's here. Um, they were asked, you know, what was your understanding of white privilege? They were asked, what are some fears and concerns that you have about challenge, uh, challenging conversations regarding whiteness, white supremacy, and systemic racism? Um, they were concerned that it could be seen as performative, um, lack of diverse perspectives. Um, they also highlighted that a lot of the positions, leadership positions, were occupied by non-racialized individuals. Um, and that's how it showed up in their organizations. And just recommendations on how to address you know, anti-racism they suggested that community organizations can support anti-racism efforts by prioritizing education and not burdening racialized communities with the sole responsibility of educating white individuals. So oftentimes when you are racialized, you're called upon to do a lot of the emotional, physical, mental labor of you know getting everyone up to speed. So it's it's uh, distributing that and delegating that. So I'm now gonna pass it over to Dwayne. I know that we're 
short on time, but hopefully all of you can stick around um, for this piece. So, Dwayne, on to you. Oh, thank you, Ashley, for that very in-depth uh, breakdown um, for the data. Uh, as a community connector, I'm here, um, Dwayne Lee's the name, and I'm here to actually give you a little bit more information on not only how we can uh, begin to make the experience change, um, but also to, to look at the limitations um, about focus group and the importance of community connectors. That title in of itself, and actually our presentation, uh, my, <clears throat> my fellow uh, uh, presenters today, are really, uh, as Ashley said, a combination of doing that work. Community Connector was our best way to say, well, we're not just focus group of, uh, facilitators. Uh, we're not just you know, working on the framework that uh, you heard earlier. We are engaged from the beginning of the process, um, look where they said, look, let's get some people from the community. And then we were able to branch out both with the work, but also um, what you might have not seen in the data and, and the charts uh, that you saw and put well together by uh, 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 both anonymizing, but also giving an opportunity to, uh, to show the data. But the importance of that data was that when you have community voices added to the table, be it at the decision-making level or at front line, you are able to get more robust data and you're also able to engage in ways that are gonna be more specific to you. The framework, that, the provincial framework that um, we presented you today uh, is essentially a way for all of you. You're all professionals in what you do. And the, the person-centered care that's required in the human services and justice sector will be built upon by frameworks like this, but catered to your specific work. Maybe it's the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls that's a focus in your area, or maybe it's the calls to action, um, the, your, your type of work that comes from conversations like this. We had an earlier slide that showed the, the types of service users and service providers that uh, came in from the Black, Indigenous, and racialized uh, groups. And then, of course, adding that key wraparound of the white privilege or racialized uh, or view of white privilege and uh, looking at that from a systemic barrier perspective. These are all things that, as a community connector, we had an opportunity not only to uh, uh, discuss why these seven uh, groups were important, both for service user and service provider, but also to start to realize that we have, and you'll all have different ways of getting more granular with that data. Uh, one of our slides, we had the Anukshuk, the Feather, and the uh, Infinity Sign to represent the, the both First Nations, um, Inuit, and Métis people. Uh, that could be a journey. The work that the community will always bring, whether it's a patient family advisory committee or uh, uh, your own version of a focus group, surveys, different ways to reach out to both the youth and the elders. Paper is for elders. You'll have a higher success with youth, as we know, when it comes to technology and phones. We also wanted to uh, uh, just make sure that we took an option of to ensure that we got some of the lessons learned from some really robust conversations. You had a few quotes uh, mentioned by Ashley earlier. I uh, won't go into those as much as saying that um, we really do have uh, a lot of areas that were skipped. Within, and it's not that they were skipped because they weren't important. They were skipped because we had conversations that said, you know what? There's 
because of Canada's cultural mosaic, we have so many different ways that we can begin to learn about each other and understand systemic racism, understand the way that social determinants of health and those social demographic implications can um, affect not only the work that you do, but from a business perspective, uh, from it top down or from the bottom up, allows information to travel because the community is having an opportunity to connect some lines that might not have otherwise uh, occurred. Um, I know that we're running down on time here, so I'm going to just briefly encapsulate um, some of the ideas here. Um, and essentially, we are looking at the community voice. Uh, community connectors were able to sit and say, you know what, the work of everything that we do, once we leave work, we become community members. So bringing that idea of whether you look at things, I'm just a community member that's uh, well disabled and trying to push the, the, the work and the, the important work through in, in many different ways that I can. But that might be different for everybody else um, from a, a leadership or even from what's coming uh, from Ministry of Health to Ontario Health. The discussions that have all happened today essentially wrap those up into one thing that I, I call, um, we, we really are building that cultural mosaic. And uh, the data that has been shown, I think, speaks to that. And I think that the fact, as a community member, to be here speaking to all you professionals today, knowing, uh, being a person with lived experience, and knowing that even peer support could be your way of starting to engage, that this focus group framework allowed us to start to see how we can begin to build on. And that's where I'm about to um, pass it off to our final uh, present, uh, well, our final slide and our present presentation to Valeria. Thank you, Dwayne. Oh, we, I did have an extra slide. All right, Nordral, I'll grab this one quickly. Um, so the allocation of sufficient time for focus groups was one of the recommendations. We had conversations that, um, again, quickly with those skipped, those made us uh, have the opportunity to see that if we had a three hour discussion with those individuals coming back again, we gave them a wrap around support. So you had a first focus group and you come back to those individuals and now you have a greater participation from people that were passionate and now want to know what happened with the words that they, they got. And less disillusioned, you're, you're gaining the trust by having these diverse uh, people and uh, their participation come in in both in person or in other ways that, um, you know, getting the, the questions out in advance, or even looking at the different ways that you can adhere to a script, but also can change wording so that you get greater input. Um, so with those said, uh, with those two things said, I believe you could leverage both the insights you can get from a focus group but also have subsequent sessions from the parts that you know you could have gathered and gone a little bit more in detail for. And that both extends your time and budget for your outreach efforts. Get the bang for the buck. And now I'll pass it off to Val, sorry. Okay, I'll just quickly um, go through next steps. So in October, our focus group report was completed. Um, right now we're focusing on knowledge exchange activities, just like this uh, conference. Um, from now until April, um, we will be developing the content for the framework. Um, in May, we hope to finalize the framework. Um, and July 2024, um, we'll develop implementation and knowledge, a knowledge exchange strategy. Um, in August of 2024, we'll focus on evaluation activities, and that should take us to next fall, where we will uh, focus more heavily on knowledge exchange activities, such as uh, webinars and the conference. And finally, in um, 
2024 slash 2025, um, we hope to disseminate uh, the anti-racism framework. And I just want to add, it's a living document that'll be um, constantly evolving and improving as needed. So thank you so much for attending our presentation. I'll pass it back to Wesley. Thank you so much, uh, folks. Um, in the interest of time, I, I imagine you we don't have that much time remaining because we're right on four o'clock, 4 p.m. Excellent presentation. Uh, a quick reminder that there is a survey for a survey link regarding the, the presentation, which we urge you to attend to. Uh, my understanding is that tomorrow there will be a session on this so that questions not asked today could be brought to the session tomorrow for further elaboration, conversation, and discussions. Um, Again, I just want to thank the, the presenters for their exemplary presentations, highlighting the complexities of doing this work and the challenges of doing this work from a critical race perspective, anti-racist perspective, engaging in decolonization, engaging in questions around white supremacy, anti-Black racism, intersectionality. It was an incredibly rich presentation of, of bringing together all these different theories and uh, perspectives. Um, thank you, folks. And um, I guess I would pass it on to you to say have a good day. Thank you, everyone. I hope to see you tomorrow at 1230. Bye. Thank All you, right. everyone. Thank you, everyone.